All right, so I'm doing a video on a relatively obscure rapper mm -hmm. that I think everybody knows, but people don't think about, which is what I want to change with this video. Okay. All right, you have to read the rap lyrics. All right. As best you can. You don't have to rap them, you just got to read them. Okay. And I'm basically going to just ask you to read those lyrics Okay. And, and riff a little bit about what you're what you're feeling about. Okay. All right. What you're reading, and okay. and what type of person would write this? Okay. <laughs> I love the start already. I just the line. asked the Jesus piece off some Christians because they sounded like idiots. They went from silver to gold to platinum. After the millennium, they'll probably be wearing a rid. The fuck is he talking about? It was the illest alive, but nobody will face it. He spit till his tongue was too torched to taste it. Privately funded corporations carbon dated his latest creations to extract the information. They found it utterly amazing. I'm known geographically and intergalactically. That's why I got extraterrestrials that want to battle me. They even tried kidnapping me and they would have snatched me if their craft didn't get trapped in the Earth's gravity. I'm the red giant of rhyme. Solar deflectors incinerate you whole in one second. Flow is untested. Those I've threatened fold under pressure. At 120 beta cycles, high volts ignite your eyeballs. This is far too technical to be... To, like, this sounds like Neil deGrasse Tyson. My urethra to your uvula quenches your thirst. Put your flames out with dry desert, dirt where leopards lurk. Lock your soul down with an esoteric weapon search. I think the uvula is the thing that hangs down in the back of your throat. Am I this is a very complicated way to say I'm gonna pee in your mouth. Who is it though? Who is it? Who has a PhD in physics, uh, but is also a rapper? This is a moral technique or Eminem. N nope. It's neither? Nope. Neither. say who said this. <laughs> why, like, it why does it stick with you? All I could think of is Lupe. Ah, oh, no, no, oh no. God. He was just out there, son. He was just out there. There is nothing cohesive in any of these bars. It's just, he's just saying stuff. I think- yeah, I, know, I know it's an element, but I don't know what it is. is. I think Iridium is a metal. Let me look it up. So call me an old head, but mainstream rap today is kind of trash. I don't say this as some old head who just believes that hip hop is dead or that all the good rap came out before 2005 or anything like that. I say this only because the very concept of hip hop in the mainstream or mainstream anything for that matter is kind of dead and what is alive is kind of trash. What I'm getting at is right now, it's kind of hard to tell what the mainstream really is compared to at least when I was a younger person consuming hip hop. The radio basically doesn't exist anymore. MTV, BET, and other corporately owned entities used to be the main way that most people interacted with music. Believe it or not, this actually lent to a bit more variety in what mainstream music for all music looked like, especially for hip hop, because they were trying to grab the largest audience. These corporals wanted to touch every market so everyone got a piece of the pie. You could get home from school one day and hear a song from the Wu-Tang Clan, and then The Roots, and then 3-6 Mafia, and then Bone Thugs and Harmony, and then Outkast, all within an hour. Four or five very different styles of hip hop all being consumed within one session. The power that MTV, BET, VH1, and the music industry as a whole had before is now really within streaming services and social media. And instead of presenting the viewer or listener with a variety of things, they can now tailor what you hear algorithmically to be the things you're most likely to enjoy. That sounds good, and this has some positives because there's far less gatekeeping in the industry and musicians can go directly to their audience with New material. They can remain independent and have more control over their careers and be less exploited. But this also has side effects, one specifically in that what's left of the mainstream or things that are widely, massively produced and promoted is that that mainstream is more homogenous now than it's ever been. And there's an absence of that sense of shared culture and community within fandoms because fandoms are kind of siloed apart from each other and barely interact like they used to. If it doesn't make sense yet, basically like everything is Drake now. And you know how I feel about Drake. It's just different versions of Drake. It's Afrobeat Drake, Spanish Drake, white Drake, and of course, Drake Drake. 
of course, there's still good music being made, a lot of really good music being made, but aside from Kendrick, there's very few rappers that are actually interesting and unique and ubiquitous to grab mainstream focus. Like I remember a couple of years ago at the Super Bowl, they had 50 Cent, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, and Kendrick along with Dr. Dre, like five or six megastar rappers from that era. You really won't be able to do that in 20 years the way things are going right now because all of those stars were ubiquitous all over TV, all over commercials, all over magazines, all over everything. 25 years from now, you'll have a handful of people waiting for Earl Sweatshirt, another handful of people waiting for Tierra Whack, and another handful of people waiting for, somebody told me there's a guy named Yeet. That's pretty good. I didn't, I didn't quite appreciate it, but like those people aren't connecting with each other like that. These days you wake up on Friday and find out that one of your favorite artists dropped a new album and it's a pleasant surprise. But back in my day, you'd be reading the Source Magazine monthly for half the year, keeping a well-organized calendar so that you know when Capadonna is gonna drop his debut album. Back then, albums dropped on Tuesdays and I would purposely take the wrong bus so that it would drop me off on Torrance so I could walk down the street to Peppermint Music and cop the newest CD for 15 to $20 and give it two or three listens overnight because I wanted to make sure that I could participate in the hip hop lunch table discussion the next day at school. I'm not going to say that those were the days, but those were the days. I miss a lot from those days, but mainly I just miss how weird hip hop was able to be at a larger scale, even in the mainstream. Not this new weird that's actually still very cool and popular, but that musty basement weird you couldn't talk about at school. Devin the Dude weird. Cool Keith weird. The point of this diatribe is that recently I realized that nothing is mainstream, which basically means that everything is mainstream, or maybe that the mainstream ceases to exist. I could be in a hip hop bubble where a particular artist is the biggest, most significant thing that I've heard in the last five years. And you can be an equally intense hip hop head and have never heard of who the hell I was talking about. The byproduct of this is that artists that would never have gotten a chance in the 90s and 2000s are some of the most significant names in the game today. People such as JPEG Mafia and Danny Brown, Earl Sweatshirt. Billy Woods. I doubt even Lupe Fiasco could have been his true self had he came out in 1993 instead of 2003. So while I love the modern era of hip hop a lot, I do want to take this opportunity to discuss a figure who was greatly responsible for what modern hip hop looks like today in both good and bad ways that sadly is almost completely absent from the consciousness of modern hip hop fans and connoisseurs. If you are in any way a rap nerd, you need to thank one rapper who was responsible for so much of that reality. And that rapper is named. Here comes a new challenger. The subject of today's video is about a rapper who spits flames like this. That may be unimpressive to many of you in the audience or anybody that knows me and how I get down with technology. The fact that I was able to do that by myself, there was no editor here, no special person coming in to do that. I made that happen, that little flame effect. That's all FD. And that was made possible by today's sponsor, Skillshare. For those who don't know, Skillshare is the online learning platform that has over 800,000 users, all watching thousands of courses to learn new skills. Whether it be things in creative fields like animation, photography, video editing, or things tied to traditional work like entrepreneurship, or things that just help improve your lifestyle and productivity. Little things like trying to improve my lighting, and most specifically, figuring out this green screen situation. Or in reality, like I don't know if y'all know, this isn't a green screen. This is my wall. This is the wall of my kitchen. And <laughs> it wasn't until a smart comment and a little time on Skillshare that I was like, man, what if I use that to put special effects on in the background? I wonder how that would work. And then within a couple of videos, I was suddenly doing it all by myself. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Skillshare can make you into a YouTuber. What I will say is that if you are interested in learning new skills that you can use in a creative field, Skillshare is a good place to start. 
no amount of small thinking or big plans is out of the range of outcomes for this site. I started my YouTube channel while still working during COVID, just kind of fooling around. And within a year, I was suddenly a professional YouTuber. I am again, not saying this because it is easy to repeat this outcome, but it's that type of let me just try attitude that I think is useful for pretty much anything you're trying to do. Start small, seek to master something, and then maybe the outcome will be way bigger than you ever planned. If you want to start that plan with Skillshare, the first 1,000 people to click the link and sign up in the description get one month of Skillshare free. I wanna say thank you to Skillshare for supporting this video, and now let's get the video started. And that rapper is named Cannabis. Kick a freestyle anytime you demand it. Uh, Brains, high density, and my memories expanded. Uh, Breaking sound barriers like the Lockheed. Even when knock knees, I run across rough terrain at mock speed. Barefoot, if you're like me, you're probably like, damn, cannabis. Because you haven't thought about them in a long time. If you're one of those rare, hardcore cannabis fans, you're hyped. And if you're a large chunk of my audience and people watching this for the first time, you're like, who? Cannabis, a.k.a. Jermaine Williams, is a New York rapper who rose to fame in the late mid 90s due to his at the time never heard before lyrical wordplay and out there persona. It's hard to imagine now, but at a time where hip hop was at a crossroads after the death of Biggie and Tupac, Cannabis was legitimately in the running for the next great rapper in the game. People, and by people, I mean me, thought that he might be the person to pick up that mantle. That seems silly now, but it didn't at the time. And it seems silly because Cannabis took numerous L's, including a lost beat with a hip hop legend, a poorly received debut album, and the emergence of better and more marketable artists with similar talents. The hype that surrounded Cannabis in the mid 90s seems like a figment of my imagination now. It's as bad as a fall off can be, to be honest but it's a really interesting story. Cannabis was born Jermaine Williams in Jamaica, but grew up in the States. However, according to what I could find, his mother's career required him to constantly relocate, meaning that he spent time in the UK, Atlanta, Miami, Washington DC, and of course, New York. At around 13 is when Cannabis says he started rapping just to be like his idols, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, Cool G Rap, and other legends of the golden era of hip hop. But he didn't start into the game immediately. He first took some time to actually do some work. And the work he did reveals one of the first things I want to point out about cannabis. Cannabis is a nerd. And I say that also being a nerd, which is why I was probably a fan of him. And most of his fans are also nerds. And beyond just being a nerd, by his own words and the stories he's told about his life, Cannabis seems like he was kind of a savant, like a legit genius level intellect, at least in some abstract way. This would be nothing unusual for a rapper to say about themselves, but the way Cannabis validates it kind of supports his claim a little differently. For example, Cannabis talks about when he first moved to the UK, he was able to take leave from school for an entire year in order to allow himself to age into the appropriate grade that he tested into. Later, straight out of high school, Cannabis is working for AT&T in the US Department of Defense as a data analyst while attending night school for computer programming. This is in the early 90s, mind you, before computer coding was something you could buy a kit for for your nine-year-old off Amazon. Cannabis was learning to do it while he was still technically a kid. And this is a skill he would use throughout his career, by the way. And when you hear the way other rappers describe cannabis, you can tell he was different in both good and bad ways. In fact, part of me wants to semi-speculate as to whether or not cannabis was neuroatypical. I don't do this lightly and I want to try to be as respectful and responsible with this speculation as possible. So please, please, please give me a little bit of grace. But 
This is something I'm also experiencing personally. I have only recently began to unpack whether or not I have lived with undiagnosed ADHD for most of my life, like a lot of older millennials my age. Back then when cannabis and I would have been children, there was no such thing as neuroatypical, no ADHD, no autism spectrum. If you exhibited any traits that we now understand as autistic or ADHD or anything else, you were either just bad or weird or lazy, possibly even all three. And this creates a tough conundrum with how black men and boys who are neuroatypical are treated, because unlike black TV nerds of the 90s and 2000s, black male nerds were still very easily seen as super predators and also still expected to perform the exaggerated swag of black masculinity that we've been hearing about for the last few years, creating an almost dysmorphic reality for these boys and men. And this, of course, is conjecture and theorizing, but I imagine that this is why you hear other rappers and people that worked with cannabis in the past describe him as a little odd because cannabis just wasn't like other rappers. The way cannabis describes his own experiences in those early days shows that there were definitely challenges that he faced socially in the rap game and, and an awkwardness that likely contributed to his failure as an artist. He was awkward, quiet, passive. He didn't manage his rising stardom with a lot of intention. He was just happy to be there, happy to be around his heroes and respected for his craft. And I've seen in interviews him kind of struggle to explain this. And I empathize with him feeling like people just don't understand you and you can't find the words to communicate something that is really important or meaningful to you. But it's just not coming out in a way that people get. You know what I'm saying? But they never went to go check the site out. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah. come on, man, get on the computer, go look at the site. You know what I'm saying? Like, you think I was joking? You think I would get on a record and say, yo, put this in your CD, Ron W, all that, and not really have have a site, you know what I mean? No, no. A lot of people don't understand like what I say, I speak actual facts. Like sometimes I talk about walking through walls and doing stuff that I know I can't do physically, you know what I mean? But but in the mind, I do all of these things. And everything that I say is just about literal, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm prepared to do anything that I say on, on, on the mic, or in the booth, whatever. Uh, it's uh, actual, it's not a game, it's not a joke, you know what I'm saying? It's not something I'm just doing, just to be doing it. I live this every day, man. Yeah. What now? Yeah. I'm not talking about now. Talking about Say back then. then. Back then. Yeah. Okay. Well, you from Queens. I'm not from Queens. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. sorry. Jamaica. I stayed in the Your people. You didn't have no Look, ties? You didn't have no. This I love you, but that was not that kind of guy. You must don't know him. Mm. Do you know him? No. You don't know him, man. You know I don't know him like broke bread with him, but I've been around. Both of us don't know. I've been around him more than you. Probably. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> right. Don't <laughs> now. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Right. But. But the point of this is at a certain point while taking night classes, cannabis got connected to group home entertainment and the hip hop group, the Lost Boys. The Lost Boys are definitely mid for their time, at least from my perspective. They had a few hits and one standout figure, the dubiously named Mr. Cheeks. <laughs> His name was really Mr. Cheeks. Hip hop is really funny. The Lost Boys had a few hits and Cannabis was working in a managerial role, but all the time writing rhymes, but not in the way that rappers did back then. And I guess maybe to an extent now, Cannabis was typing his rhymes on a laptop, which wasn't even easy to get in the mid nineties. Like in the mid nineties, the only people that had laptops were people that were on hackers. I, um, Can was the first person that I saw writing his lyrics on a computer. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says that. Everybody that I'm bringing like, okay, they be like, yo, he, was, yo, he used to write his doing on the laptop. Yeah. So I'm like, like a, like a robot though. Like, yeah. like, I'm like, yo, are you human? Um, <laughs> But he was clearly writing some dope shit because eventually he would use his connections to start making waves, specifically in the burgeoning world of the hip hop mixtape. So you know how today a new rapper can just upload their work directly to SoundCloud or Spotify or TikTok in the hopes that their music will find an audience, maybe become a popular sound or meme, or just get a bunch of algorithm love and they can get a buzz, some new fans, maybe a co-sign from a major figure. Well, things were very different and much more difficult back then. Because back then we had the gatekeepers. I talk about the gatekeepers in this Drake video that you can go watch after this. What I call the gatekeepers were basically a nebulous cartel of hip hop execs, radio personalities, street bigwigs, promoters, etc., who kind of served as middlemen between any hopeful hip hop star and access to the corporate powers that could make them a star. There was no let me upload my song and see what the algorithm thinks about it. It was either selling tapes and CDs out of your trunk or posting outside the radio station, strip club, or 
D-Boy spot hoping to hand someone your demo tape in between talent shows. More than anything though, it was about being connected somehow to hopefully make the whole process easier. This is why hip hop has way more Nepo babies than some of you might believe. Through his connections to group homes, somehow cannabis made it to the ears of DJ Clue, probably the most significant innovator of the underground mixtape and definitely the most significant DJ mixtape figure at the time. And with no exaggeration, I'm confident that as soon as Clue heard cannabis spit, it was clear he was going to be going places very soon. Speak of frequencies, dogs will have trouble hearing. Cannabis is the lyrical version of German engineering. Raw metaphors keep you high for months. Fly around the earth twice without refueling once. Ain't too many categories I could fit in when it comes to spitting. Cause I'm overqualified for the position. Mixtapes were basically like maybe EPs now, they were package showcases which allowed rappers to just spit their best bars over already established beats. It wasn't where you found rappers original content, it was really hip hop in its original purest form. A showcase of writing skills but not song writing skills which will come up later. And no rapper was better equipped to just jump on a dope beat out of nowhere and showcase exactly what made them special than cannabis. In that mid 90s era until 1997, nobody came out hotter than cannabis did, which is saying a lot because cannabis was a part of what I see as the first ever freshman class in hip hop culture. And again, after the death of Biggie and Tupac was competing with a lot of figures who came out around the same time that would go on to be hip hop legends. For those who don't know, the freshman class is an annual thing done in hip hop magazine, Double X. Every year for years, Double XL has had a freshman class where they bring together all of the hot and buzzing young rappers that are just emerging onto the scene for that year and give them all a chance to build more buzz and make noise and promote whatever their new projects are and just kind of like excite the community about who these new people are. This tradition has introduced the audiences to future legends like Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, Lupe Fiasco, Kid Cudi, Future, etc. It's one of the more momentous events in any hip hop nerd's calendar. Years before Double XL's first freshman class, Double XL's magazine predecessor and main competitor, The Source Magazine, which is a legendary magazine co founded by legendary weird guy Benzino. I gotta make a video about The Source one day. I, I gotta make a video about The Source one day. Anyway, the Source Magazine first ran its own version of this concept in 1998, calling it Rap's New Generation. And much like XXL, it was a big photo shoot featuring many lesser known, but soon to be future legends in hip hop, such as the late DMX and Big Pun, Cameron, 8Ball and MJG, Capone and Noriega, and of course, Cannabis. Pretty much everyone on this list went on to do big things and deserved to be there, even Lord Tariq and Peter Gunn seemed like a big deal at the time, which I mean, if you heard Uptown Baby in any time between like 98 and 2002, you were having a good time. This freshman class brought together all aspects of the hip hop scene, but for the rap nerds, for those of us here to scare the hoes, you were there for cannabis. Aside from Corrupt and Big Pun, no one was even close to Cannabis' level lyrically. Cannabis was different. Again, going back to the point that Cannabis was just not the typical person to be in this space, it came through in the imagination of his rhymes. He just said things that, especially during that first run of mixtapes and guest appearances, you had never heard before. I'm talking you like a bird. It ain't cause I respect you, God. It's because I'm trying to find the perfect place for me to sit on. Niggas hear about me and discreetly set up a date to meet me to see if they can defeat me. So I ain't ready to let no motherfucker eat me. That's why you find little pieces of MCs in my feces weekly. You can't beat me. You can't control or delete me. Nigga, you can't even shine on a song that feeds me. Remember again that growing up, all of Cannabis' favorite rappers were wordsmiths. They were all New York rappers whose main focus was flows, wordplay, and clever punchlines. And a lot of that stuff had kind of went away in the early 90s with the rise of gangster rap and then shiny suit rap. But that was still the influence that Cannabis was bringing to the table along with his galaxy brain, which gives us lines like this. this little nigga with heart from North New York. The only thing faster than the speed of light is the speed of dark with the jaws of the great white shark. I rip you apart. My state of the art, lyrical laces, is straight to shark. And here's where we get to the first major contribution that Cannabis doesn't get enough credit for, although he probably wouldn't want a lot of credit for this because it's not necessarily the best thing. But if you ask me, K-1000 
Cannabis is the true father of lyrical miracle rap as we know it today. And of course, that's not necessarily a good thing. When you think of lyrical rap, what comes to mind? It's probably this. Or this. Everybody in my business, homie, give a damn about you when them critics, homie, made a couple million that they all up on me. I remember the days when they wasn't. And yes. I used to read a quick Nick magazine. Red and Snippy, Tommy Pickles, and the gays between. I'm watching TV in the dark. Every Saturday, double dare with the main man, Marky Mark. This is all very cringe. Lyrical miracle rap is cringe. It's a pejorative term to describe this overly complex, self-serious, and let's be frank, today, very white formula of rapping that has taken a hold as a popular style in the last decade or so. The thing is, lyrical miracle rap has been around forever. That is what Rakim and Cool G Rap did back then, which means there was a time when it didn't come off so corny. In fact, Cannabis states himself that this was the rhyme style du jour in hip hop in the early 90s. Because in the beginning, we were all lyrical miracle guys, right? You know what I'm saying? But then, because that's what we'd get on. So we just say lyrical miracle because you know he's saying lyrical, so you're looking at the next word to rhyme with lyrical. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you lyrical, miracle, spiritual, individual, and all that. We were all that in the beginning. All of us were. Right. And then, and then it got to the point where some artists came out and they were more... You know, to the to that the, the blink. I'm not I'm not singling out. You know, shout out to Cash Money, but I'm not singling them out. The blink, blink, shit. Bling, the blink phase because they started to bring error. Right. right? Yeah. They so did. when so when the blink era came and so much bread was being made from it mm -hmm. that you know everybody started getting bread on that side of things, and then the lyrical miracle dudes was just the backpackers. Mm -hmm. you know? And you can still hear the elements of it in many rappers that aren't cringe today from Lupe Fiasco to Black Thought. Complex, multisyllabic rhyming is never going away and it shouldn't because it's awesome. But what makes it go from complex rhyming to lyrical miracle is a lack of effective cohesion with other elements of lyricism. When you can tell the rapper is expecting us to just be impressed with their ability to rhyme awfully hot with coffee pot. That's an awfully hot coffee pot. It has little to no other mastery with any other elements of rapping, let alone songwriting. Being a good lyricist has plenty of variants. There's no like one definition that'll satisfy everyone. I have opinions that some people would not agree with. For example, I think the lyricism of 2 Chains is criminally underappreciated. And at the risk of alienating old heads, I think the Migos are some of the best lyricists of the last decade. And this is not so much for clever wordplay, which they definitely aren't necessarily masters of, but their ability to ride a beat and create melodies and sounds with their rhymes. Like when you hear a Migos beat by itself, It's actually pretty underwhelming. It's not really doing a lot, is it? Amigo's song doesn't fully start until they start rapping. Let's get it. Hop off for 16, passing the ditch of deep. I know that's not a challenger. Big one. I keep some members with me in the fridge. Get coat seat. They some cannibals. Eat us. They like the if you can't feel me here, that's fine. But I'ma just say this. The people that can't recognize the appeal of the Migos flow are probably some of the same people that don't understand why cannabis, despite having amazing bars and punchlines, didn't pan out with listeners. Cannabis really only mastered one element of great lyricism, which is the ability to say dope ass creative shit. It's a great talent, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't necessarily make for great music. And at this time, hip hop was making some really, really great music. The 80s and the early 90s of hip hop was all about the fundamentals of lyricism. This is again the era of Rakim, Karis, One, etc. But going into the mid 90s, suddenly you had Dr. Dre with The Chronic, Bone Thugs and Harmony with East 1999, The Roots with Do You Want More. The era of just putting on a break beat with lyrical flourishes was ending. Nas is Illmatic, Ready to Die from Biggie, and Reasonable Doubt from Jay-Z all released within a few years and changed the standard for what was expected from rap music between 94 and 96. And by the time Outkast released their third album, Equimini, late 1998, the traditional New York lyricist era was dead and would really hibernate for like several decades before becoming relevant again with people like 
you know, Joey Badass and ASAP Rocky and eventually the whole Griselda crew. And this is the thing that tripped up cannabis because while we were all buzzing about these mixtapes and these guest appearances on other people's tracks, cannabis hadn't actually shown the ability to write a song. He didn't show how to bring together a theme. This again would have been fine five years earlier, but as hip hop began to really avail itself as a serious musical art form and a commercial enterprise, people wanted more from rappers and cannabis was just the wrong type of rapper for the era he was entering in. But because he was in New York, which was swiftly getting passed by by the rest of hip hop in that time frame, he was held up as the next big thing, even though he probably should never have been in that category. But back to the particulars, it's 97, 98, and things are still looking good for cannabis. Not a lot of people have figured out his limitations as an artist yet. In fact, going into the release of his highly anticipated debut album, he had two things happen to him that should have been some of the best possible things to happen for his career. He got a co-sign from a super talented and real regarded artist that worked with him on his debut album and legitimate hype building beef with a bona fide rap legend. In most situations, I feel like you couldn't really have asked for a better way to lead into your first album. But unfortunately for Cannabis, these two factors that should have been boosted his career became albatrosses that would keep him from ever reaching the potential that many thought he had. So let's start with the legendary beef with one LL Cool J. LL Cool J should arguably be in anyone's all time top 10 rapper list and is the closest thing to Jay-Z that existed before Jay-Z and like during Jay-Z. LL is an example of a rapper that could do everything. He could go full lyrical miracle battle rap. He had an amazing sex appeal and was loved by women. But he could also still churn out bangers that you wanted to ride in your car blasting. On top of this, he was also an actor and he's probably the, is he the most accomplished like rapper turned actor? Maybe. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm just going to, I'm going to put the most accomplished rapper turned actor right here. This is him. Is it LL Cool J? All right, whatever. Anyway, the man was top tier from the 80s into the early 2000s. However... I get the feeling that LL Cool J is a bit of an asshole, or at least competitive to a fault, and highly egotistical, which caused him to beef with many prominent rappers in his original era, including Ice-T and Cool Mo D. And there are plenty of stories about his behavior in the industry at the time, and even gossip of his behavior on set in his acting career. There's also his incredibly embarrassing political overtures towards conservatism, and his foray into country rap where he compares his hat to a Confederate flag. His, his his hat was also a Sharks fan. <laughs> oh, rap is so fucking weird. My hat is like a shark fan. Yeah. But well before that was LL's seventh album, Phenomenon where LL once again was seeking to maintain his status as one of the top rappers in the game, especially in the wake of the deaths again of Biggie and Tupac. And one would do that for LL, who was at the time more known for his commercial club jams for the ladies, such as I Need Love and Doing It, was a street banger like 4321, featuring some of the hottest rappers in the game, old and new, such as Method Man, along with a young and new DMX, and of course, Cannabis. By the time Cannabis popped up on this song, he had built up quite the reputation of completely outshining other rappers on any guest appearance he made. Basically, if you were listening to Cannabis on someone else's song in the mid 90s, you were skipping past all the parts that were not Cannabis, and they almost always allowed him to go last on the track. For those a little bit younger than me, but old enough to remember, think what Lil Wayne was doing to the rap game in the late 2000s and early 2010s. He was so prolific and coveted that not only would they let him go last, they would give him time to spit not just like your normal 16 bars, but he was spitting like 50 bars on some people's song. Whether it was on the Lost Boys Beast from the East or Desperados on the Firm album or whatever the name of that song is with Common, people were letting him go. They loved it. And in an ego-driven industry, this was unheard of. And it's possible Cannabis had gotten this treatment so much that he didn't fully appreciate that he was being looked at as a next best thing, which means that other rappers are probably starting to size him up. Other rappers like LL Cool J. So again, regardless of whether you want to speculate on the neurotypical or neurodivergent status of cannabis, 
It's safe to say that cannabis was awkward in social situations. It was often earnest and honest to a fault. So in his earnest and honest admiration for one of his idols, LL Cool J, he saw a tattoo of a microphone that LL Cool J had had for years and directly asked him, hey, can I get a tattoo on my arm just like you? To which, according to Cannabis, LL said, sure. Excited and enthused by this, Cannabis then proceeded to start his verse on this song with LL Cool J with the following lines. Oh, Method, where the guards at? Redman, where the squad at? L, is that a mic on your arm? Let me borrow that. Who's the guard of rap? You this was the original verse, and like other situations, it was also a bit longer than everyone else's, which is saying a lot on this ensemble posse track with so many other rappers on it. it. Seemed like it was the typical situation that Cannabis had been used to, until later on, Cannabis is told that he needs to re-record his verse and take that opening line out of the song. At some point in time, LL's ego got the best of him, and he decided not only did Cannabis have to change that line, he had to change and shorten his verse, and he would re-record his own verse and make it into a not so subliminal diss at Cannabis. Cannabis also claims that he wasn't even invited to the original shoot for the video. I'm assuming that some type of corporate money situation is what kept Cannabis on the song in the first place. Because they tried to replace him with Master P of all people, which is just, Hip-hop hip is weird. Cut my mic on. It's time to get rowdy. Got homies from the N-O to the N-Y. Bowdy, bowdy. This is somewhat of a missed opportunity for Cannabis because this song was a Billboard hit and was Cannabis' biggest exposure to the world and he didn't get to shine like he had done on other songs that other people had let him rap on. LL Cool J did everything he could to make things worse. From LL's perspective, he claims he never approved the idea that Cannabis should get his own mic tattoo. So this kind of shitty situation for Cannabis actually yielded incredible opportunity. It gave him a clear and understandable excuse to release a full diss track, one of the easiest ways to build buzz. Whether it is Twitter or YouTube or hip hop, the easiest way for anyone to build a buzz and draw attention to themselves is to talk bad about another person. And if you had a legitimate reason within hip hop to talk bad about a legend, that was like the biggest win you could probably get under the circumstances. And then to compound on that, Wyclef Jean of the Fugees, a burgeoning megastar in his own and a legitimate hit maker, signed up to produce Cannabis' first album along with the diss track. At the time, people figured that this combination would be perfect. Cannabis' raw and complex battle raps will be cultivated and kind of squeezed into a quality music project by the eclectic and gifted Wyclef, fresh off of co-producing one of the best rap albums of all time in the score. Everything was aligned for Cannabis. He had built a buzz in the underground mixtape scene. He had shined on every guest appearance. And now he had an easy layup of an opportunity to grab a ton of attention with his first single by making it talk bad about a legendary rapper who, let's be honest, at the time was catching flack for being a little bit too much of a ladies man, a little too much lip licking and popping up on TV. The song will be titled Second Round Knockout, and just as icing on the cake, he randomly got Mike Tyson to provide some guest narration on it. How could Cannabis lose here? Second Round Knockout isn't a bad diss track. In fact, it's a pretty good one. But for who Cannabis had been built up to, for what the Cannabis fans had been hearing in their musty dorm rooms for the last three, four years, it was kind of underwhelming. Cannabis had made a name for these creative 50 bar long verses on other people's songs, finally had a song all to himself on his own beat and production and all he kicked was two relatively normal length verses. Now this isn't like 2023 where songs are all a minute and 45 seconds long. Back in my day, a song would be three or four minutes and that was like a normal length. Later, LL will respond with a superior track, which just showed the difference between Cannabis, a lyrical miracle battle rap style rapper, and LL, a legend and musician and songwriter. Because basically, LL just said, hey, Cannabis, you're a fucking loser. <laughs> that was it. That was basically the whole track. Of his fans don't exist. I'm going 
Again, this wasn't the greatest diss ever, but it was clear who the winner was. And losing a battle to LL, who had spent half of his time in the public eye acting and pouting his lips was akin to when Drake beat Meek Mill. It was a heavy blow to Cannabis going into the release of his debut album. Which brings us to Cannabis's debut album, Can I Bust? And yeah, it just didn't work. So I listened to this album as much as I could for the first time in, I guess, 25 years. And I'll say it's probably not as bad an album as I remembered, but it still was incredibly disappointing for what cannabis fans were looking forward to. And it exposed a fatal flaw in cannabis that he seemingly never figured out, which is how to make a good cohesive song, how to make a functional album. Pretty much everything on this album feels forced and unnatural and <laughs> Just wait till I describe some of this shit. The album includes an ode to conspiracy theories, which is something that will become a motif for cannabis throughout his years. A corny novelty song that will become one of the most intentionally or unintentionally funny rap videos of that decade. The worst attempt at melding hip hop and rock music in an era where every rapper was trying to do that at least once. And a song that tries to personify Let You Read a verse and the goal here is for you to tell me what this verse is talking about <laughs> what it's talking about yes what this verse is what what the subject of this verse is what's going okay. on all right i'm gonna put it in the chat uh and then i just want your just general blind reaction to whatever the hell is going on okay uh I heard a soft moan in the middle of March, then I felt a powerful force push me forward like a dart. On your mark, get set, go. I was off. The cello was my propeller, wiggling back and forth. Then I set across before the border, Mother Nature's comma. You have to read that line okay. of my competitors. I need <laughs> My competitors was swimming, so I swam harder, submerged in water, praying to my heavenly father. So I make it through, I'm a goner, screaming out death before this honor, because I'm awesomely stronger, my stamina lasts longer, I was destined to be a, is this about sperm? <laughs> the songs that work the best on the album are the ones where it's clear cannabis was just in his most natural bag, spitting clever battle rhymes over a dope beat in Patriots and Buckingham Palace but that was kind of it. The album went gold, but in the face of the type of hype that Cannabis had garnered, it was seen as a huge disappointment. There was an immediate backlash against Wyclef by fans of Cannabis, saying that he ruined Cannabis by trying to force him into a style that didn't coincide with his actual talent. Cannabis also shared this sentiment and quickly cut ties with Wyclef, heading into his follow-up album, but the damage had already been done. And Cannabis' album, 2000 BC, which leaned into what Cannabis did best, and in many ways was exactly what the fans said they wanted, was still met with overall failure. It was at this time that it was starting to settle in to probably everybody that Cannabis would never fully live up to the hype he garnered in 96 and 97 and 98. Cannabis was still spitting really cool rhymes, but they didn't seem as cool anymore. Like consider that Cannabis was still spitting lyrical miracle rap, but like two years after his 2000 BC album, Kanye West will be coming out. It, it, the game was just changing around him. In the same year that he dropped his very disappointing album, one of his contemporaries dropped probably his best ever album and one of the best albums of that generation, a person that cannabis would always be compared to unfavorably that really is the holder of a legacy that he kind of should have. Look, any rapper saying those kind of rhymes in this day and age, in this period of time, trying to battle Eminem is worse than David Starr trying to battle Proof IQ, B flat and bizarre. After the Demarshall Mathers LP, he was being recognized genuinely as the top rapper in the game, and due to his whiteness, he influenced a generation of cringe, mostly white, lyrical miracle rappers for decades to come, even though if you would have talked to Eminem at that time, I guarantee you he'd have said a person that he was impressed by was Cannabis. People are going to fight me on this because it's a meme to make fun of Eminem now, but Eminem wasn't seen as cringe at the time. In fact. 
It's the emotional depth and thematic resonance of the Marshall Mathers LP that made it transcend the repetitive battle raps of 2000 BC. While Cannabis is trying and failing to get across any type of theme in his records, Eminem was able to convey so much weight and gravitas with songs like The Way I Am and Stan and Marshall Mathers. It doesn't hold the same weight now because Eminem will retread these exact same subjects over and over and over again in his later work. And the cringiness of lyrical miracle rap, as well as the fact that a lot of Eminem's language and sensibilities became quickly outdated. We look at them differently, but in that moment in 2000, at the turn of the millennium, black or white, when the way I am came on, you felt what he had to say. Meanwhile, cannabis, Cannabis was dropped from his record label after 2000 BC, but this didn't stop him and he went independent and dropped See the True Hollywood Story in 2001. And this is where I stopped paying attention to cannabis completely because I was in college and I was making a concerted effort to stop scaring the hoes. Coming back 20 years later to hear See True Hollywood Story is actually not that bad an album and from interviews that Cannabis does, it seems to be one of his favorite records he's done as well. And for a moment, Cannabis seemed to hit a stride. The next album for Cannabis was My Club, which is seen by most as his best album. And most interestingly and importantly is where we also start recognizing just how innovative Cannabis was being while nobody was paying attention to him. So this is the early 2000s and the pathways to hip hop success were starting to vary up a little bit. Most rappers were scooped up by record labels who handled marketing, promotion, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And it was an incredibly shitty deal that a lot of legendary rappers are broke today because of. But years ago, the alternative was staying underground. Staying underground and independent was great, but the problem was independent promotion lacked centralized distribution. A rapper couldn't get their stuff out to a large audience without the support of a corporate machine. They couldn't promote, they couldn't build a buzz, they couldn't collaborate, they couldn't let people know what they were doing, unless of course their name was Cannabis. Cannabis created, cultivated, and managed his own hip hop following by building his own website from scratch called Mic Club. And by the way, this was the second website he had built for his album, because he actually built a website for Can I Bus called www.cannabis.com. But this wasn't just a website, y'all. This was basically the first social media presence for a hip hop artist. Cannabis could post snippets from songs, messages, pictures, all kinds of behind the scenes stuff directly to his fans who could leave comments and argue with each other on message boards. He basically started the Coliseum all by himself. As I said before, cannabis is probably a legit savant. I don't know much about web design. Y'all know I can barely stream without my computer blowing up, but I imagine that building your own website by yourself in 2002 was not something that most normal people could do. And I wanna again point out, Cannabis didn't go to college for web design. He went there for data analysis and he did it 10 years prior to this and hadn't taken a class since. And I don't think web design was even a curriculum to have in 1995. Yet here he was, an untrained part-time web developer and rapper. He was doing something for fun that now is a requirement to have a career in hip hop. And when he talks about it now, he sounds kind of frustrated because it seems like this is what he really wanted the whole time. Years before TikTok, Spotify, Instagram, etc., Cannabis pioneered the framework for how modern hip hop exists. He saw the value of going directly to your audience and engaging them and creating that parasocial cult of personality around your music to find those fans that will argue with you about them on comment sections and on Twitter. And again, doesn't get credit for it. What musicians get credit for is the music. And this album, Mike Club, while having a very cool concept behind it, was also ignored by most of his non-hardcore fans. The writing was on the wall for Cannabis' career. The fall off was upon him. No matter what the career path in entertainment, the fall off is a place where people want to avoid. It almost always looks exactly the same, though. A young burgeoning star shows promise and is heralded as the next big thing. They have some really significant early success, but somewhere along the lines, things don't click. People move on to the next, next big thing and the cycle repeats, but the person falling off is still there. We just don't see what they're going through. They may scramble to make something out the opportunities they have left. 
Next thing you know, they're on Dancing with the Stars. It's it's hard to say. It's a tough process, I imagine, especially in hip hop, where a core part of the culture is its combative and cutthroat nature. The idea of losing on any level can be its own albatross, never to allow you back on top, even if you have good stuff to get you there. You become a punchline of sorts, and people make fun of the very idea that you were seen as a big deal in the first place. I think this is what happened to Cannabis. If his interviews over the last couple of years are any indication, Cannabis didn't take this failure well. He was three or four albums into his career with marginal success. His buzz was gone. His cosigns were gone. The one thing that Cannabis was great at, people didn't want. Feeling stuck and stifled and probably struggling with his dreams deferred, Cannabis did what any relatively famous and I'm sure relatively wealthy gold selling rap artist would do. He enlisted in the military after a 9-11 attacks. Who writes the song? I write the song. Rhymes accelerate through the cyclotron and nine microns. Turn the mic on. Regurgitate the windpipe bomb. The opposite of a black long is the white one. Can I bust in your face? Hip hop is weird. Yeah, in 2002, Cannabis joined the army and went through military training and learned how to drive transport vehicles, a skill that he actually still benefits from today. Cannabis seems to indicate that he never saw combat though, but still, this is quite the weird flex. Cannabis says he actually trained with the late Pat Tillman and it was watching Pat Tillman's intense Navy SEAL training that let him know that maybe he had overreacted a little bit in trying to seek change. There's rumors that he ironically was discharged for smoking cannabis, but I don't know if this was really the case. Cannabis denies it. Either way, shit, that's one way to react, I guess. At the same time, Cannabis never fully left hip hop. He just left the public eye. And now with the internet age finally catching up to Cannabis' comfort zone, he could start to move differently. Cannabis says he just kind of wanted to get away. He wanted to stop being Cannabis and the army was the way he chose to do it. Thankfully, he came out unscathed, which is not something you can say for a lot of men, especially black men in the army at that time. But it still was quite the decision to make. At the same time, Cannabis never fully left hip hop. He even has a freestyle out there somewhere of him rhyming in front of a tank. He just left the public eye. And now with the internet age finally catching up to where Cannabis had been the whole time, he could start to move differently and continue to innovate. After the army, Cannabis would drop several more albums to mix reviews. But by now, he had his people. He had his fan base. He had those that wanted exactly what he was given. They weren't worried about whether or not the beats were so great or the themes and songwriting was up to par. They wanted to hear him do lyrical, miracle, metaphysical, spiritual rhymes all up in their ears. The ground was fertile for him to slot into a niche that he had been trying to build in his own for years. And going into the mid to late 2000s, the blog era, the Dat Piff era, the hip hop mixtapes era, and all that, it was time for the rap nerd takeover. Lyrical miracle rappers had their own community where they could roam freely without needing to depend on major label support or write good songs. And while you see super lyrical rappers like Lupe Fiasco, Talib Kali, Most Def, etc. breaking to the mainstream, you also have rappers like Ace of Rock, Blue, Brother Ali, Immortal Technique, and Tech 9 and so many other like lyrical miracle stuff aside, really great artists explode into the scene with minimal major label help. And Cannabis now, the unsung father in this wave, was going to prove that nobody would out rap nerd him. And he showed this in maybe his most cool achievement in music, the Poet Laureate series. Poet Laureate was a series of songs on several albums where Cannabis would just completely indulge in his lyrical miracle greatness, making very long songs with no choruses, just beat changes, going as long as into 15 minutes of nonstop scaring the maiden's energy. But in 2007, he took that concept to a whole new level, doing something that had, I'm pretty sure, never been before and legitimately one of the coolest things that has ever been done in hip hop. Cannabis gave the world Poet Laureate Infinity. And just sit down for a second while I explain the glory of this marvel of engineering. 
Cannabis, ever the computer genius, made his own web stem player and wrote and recorded five different 200 bar songs with the same rhyme scheme and the same overall cadence, along with different beats. He loaded all five of these songs onto the stem player and it's designed so that when you press play, all five of the songs start playing at once with the other four being muted. But the way it works is that you can click play on any giving stem and it would jump on the next bar and seamlessly play that section of bars until you let it finish the entire song or click to another one. The result is a 1000 bar song with near infinite combinations of how the song could come out. It was basically a choose your own adventure song, which sounds dorky when I say it out loud, but it was the coolest thing in the world. You could literally make your own version of his song through a stem player and many did. And that's what made him so special because Cannabis never really cared about all of this shit. If you listen to him talk, he just wanted to rhyme. It's the most unabashedly nerdy thing in the history of hip hop and I love it. Now understand, this is the most lyrical miracle stuff you have ever heard. Walk through the archive files of all styles. The East Wing aisle goes on for five miles. More rappers than fans, more fans, rap than fans. Hip hop will continue to expand. Poets should be rappers, rappers should be lyricists. The current industry model collapse imminent. Because it's so many bars that he had to fit together, it genuinely makes absolutely no sense as a song. It's like a hip hop version of a Mars Volta album. But that doesn't mean there aren't dope bars in this thing. They're just kind of all over the place. Sadly, I'm pretty sure that this no longer exists in a way that you can actually do it in this original form. But if you look through YouTube, you can find all the pieces to it. You won't be able to like do the mix matching thing, but you'll at least be able to hear what it sounded like. And you'll also be able to hear some people's versions of those songs. So yeah, Cannabis was in his bag. Having shared the pressure of being a superstar, Cannabis was in a renaissance. And in this early world of algorithmically optimized consumption, he could go directly to those people just like him to give them exactly what they wanted. Things were looking up for cannabis again until they weren't. In the early 2010s, the world of underground battle rap was emerging into the internet scene. Greatly inspired by rappers like cannabis, along with the extreme insularity and online nature of hip hop fandom, rappers from literally all over the world, like literally all over the world, created a new format for hip hop entertainment, the acapella battle rap. I'm planning a whole video on battle rap, so I won't explain it too much, but just understand it's one of the most amazing, scaring the maidens, nerdiest things in all of music. I know I've said that a lot this video, but if you know, you know. Anyway, there's this incredibly overrated, incredibly corny battle rapper named Disaster, who is like the epitome of everything bad about lyrical miracle rapping. Don't get me wrong, he's very gifted in that and very clever and has had many an entertaining room shaking moment on the battle rap stage but man is this motherfucker cringe listen here you little indian Still, cringe is the name of the game in underground acapella battle rap. And at the time, he was the largest draw for the second largest company in the acapella battle rap game, King of the Dot. And somehow, some way, they managed to get a match between Disaster and Cannabis. I'm not sure if this was the first time that a mainstream rapper had entered the battle rap stage, but regardless, it was a huge deal because Cannabis was among his people. And so many of the people in the crowd watching and people that were performing, the people that did this type of battle rap, you can guarantee many of them were influenced by cannabis. Half of them, including fucking Disaster, sounded just like them. It would be an easy win for cannabis, not necessarily to beat Disaster in the battle, which like, you know, may or may not have happened, but just to be immersed in an environment that wanted exactly what he had to offer, sadly it would again be a significant public failure for cannabis. Probably one of the more embarrassing moments in hip hop history. I'm not, I'm not a good freestyler, all right? So work with me. You win this, all right? But I want to 
still spit my shit. You understand me? You understand me? I don't really know what happened to Cannabis before this battle. He's been aloof and cagey about it, but obviously he wasn't well here. His vibe was clearly off. He was in a sling. He had stitches in his head and sunglasses on. Everything about what he did was just... The thing about modern battle rap is that it's not just rapping, it's live theater, it's a performance. And you have to rap off memory or be able to freestyle. And freestyling under that type of pressure is something that breaks even the most experienced and skilled battle rappers sometimes. And here's the ironic revelation. Cannabis, for all his battle rapping style, was not an experienced freestyle battle rapper. At least not in the style of modern battle rap without a beat. Cannabis was a writer. When he was younger, he says he could memorize hundreds of bars at a time. But here under the spotlight and probably his most public appearance in years in the most anticipated appearance that he would make since the late 90s, cannabis choked and choked bad. Nobody was getting back. I know you're cussing that close. Right. And I'm not like that anymore. I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I can still go ahead and go for mines and make a record sound good. When it's all said and done, it's going to be hip hop. Right. But at that time, when you wanted to come down to, to hardcore, I had four, rhyme, four hours of rhymes in my head. It wasn't 30 pages of rhymes in this bitch in this motherfucker. It wasn't that. It was right. really four hours. I broken language, the beat. Mm -hmm. I had it recorded on a 90 minute tape back to back where you put it in the Sony or the Denon and it goes all the way and then it flips over by itself and it goes all the way back as you can select. You right. know them Jones? Yeah. That was my workout tape. So I just mm -hmm. sit there and rhyme for it till the four hours and I could skip to any rhyme at any point. So you wouldn't even know that it wasn't off the head or what have you. And it was really like that. Yeah. I, could, I was really doing, or he was doing that yeah. back then. Right. I got to speak about it in the third person because it was true. Right. Can I do that now? No. I still often find this scene just funny due to the level of shot and fraud. I'm also, again, tempted to consider whether or not cannabis like me, a man grew up in an era where being neurodivergent wasn't a thing, kind of like unmasked here. Again, I don't want to speculate a lot, but as you look over the course of cannabis's career, you hear him talk about his experiences and you hear the way people speak about him. At a minimum, it's fair to say cannabis is an oddball. And when I get beyond the cringe humor of the moment, I can't help but see a brother struggling to perform in a social setting appropriately and failing miserably. And of course, by now in the early 2010s, the internet had entered into its ancient phase of memes and virality and every hip hop fan saw this. For some fans who had barely heard or seen Cannabis since 1998, this was their first reintroduction to them. Not the innovations he made with Mike Club, not the pioneering of hip hop social media culture, not the Poet Laureate series, this. It cannot have been easy to have built and rebuilt and rebuilt and try and fail again, even in your own circles and chosen community, the way Cannabis has. Like for Cannabis to be rejected from mainstream hip hop was nothing. He wasn't the first super lyrical rapper to be relegated to musty dorm room basements in internet hip hop. And he definitely isn't the last. But this embarrassment was in front of those who were his peers and it had to hit differently. Cannabis took this L and got back to the lab. And for the last decade plus, he became his own thing in the underground, away from the spotlight still. He supplemented his life by getting into trucking and boating. The man never stopped. He loved a thing. He didn't just want to be a star. He didn't just love the idea of being rich and famous. He loves rapping and he kept doing it. Now, before you run and jump through Cannabis's catalog, understand, buyer beware, Cannabis got a really into conspiracy theories. He has a whole album dedicated to the work of Alex Jones in the mid 2000s. And like most rappers of his era, his lyrical content and sensibilities are a product of their time. 
But now in his 40s, Cannabis is back to enjoying a niche career that he's built, still coming out with albums, one I think just last year. And finally, he's starting to pop up in the hip hop podcast circuit. So people are finally giving him his flowers a little bit and he's able to tell his story. And that's all I want. I don't want you to love his cringe, lyrical, miracle, spiritual, individual rhymes. Hell, I don't, obviously. But even if his music isn't your bag, damn, like, can't you appreciate this man's story? Do you not recognize that he left an indelible mark on the culture? That had he came out today, he'd have never maybe made it to Double XL's freshman class, but he'd have been loved and highly regarded as an underground independent rapper doing exactly what he planned to do over 20 years ago. In a modern music and especially hip hop landscape where everything is so homogenous and often bland, I'd argue it's more important to remember the figures who made hip hop and music and just music culture weird and different. Without cannabis, there's no Lupe, no Danny Brown, no Doom, no Peggy, no Billy Woods. And yes, there's also maybe no Hobson. So like, I don't know, that might be a good trade off. I may be wrong, but to me, that's dope. From a historical perspective, you can't deny what he added to the game for better or for worse. And for me, a man who's always been fascinated with the oddballs and the outcasts, I just wanted to give this man his flowers. That's all I got today, y'all. Please remember to support the sponsor. Please join your boy's Patreon so I can keep making content like this. That's all I got for today, y'all. Peace.